Hey, happy today, happy every day. We are on chapter 18 this week, and I am so excited. This is one of my favorite topics, corporate governance. I'm just gonna go ahead and read along what's in the book because it's a pretty cool story. And at the end, I'll tell you uh, personally, uh, a personal experience of mine that's tied into Oracle and this Mark Hurd gentleman that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, let's do this together. I'm not sure if you all got the book yet, so I'm doing the favor of reading it to you. Mark Hurd. Mark Hurd arrived as the chief executive officer at Hewlett Packard in 2005. The company's board of directors, a body of strong and conflicted personality, had just fired Carly Fiorina, the first woman ever to lead a corporation as big as HP. Her dual sins were trying to dominate the board and allowing the stock price to languish. Her story is the subject of the case study at the end of the chapter 18. You guys can also look her up, Carly Fiorina. You can look it up on the internet. On you. Back to Mr. Hurd. Hurd got along with the board and got results. He was diligent and relentless, dictating a regimen of cost cutting wringing waste from every department, forcing managers to justify every dollar in their budgets. Soon he eliminated 14,500 jobs, about 10% of the company's workforce. His severities were resented by some, but share prices climbed. He also had strategic vision. Major acquisitions moved Hewlett Packard into growing markets. He acquired electronic data systems, then shed another 24,600 workers in the consolidation. So that's known as a merger or these people lost their jobs. So, so far, few jobs got. He acquired 3Com, then Palm. Palm pilots were something that were way before smartphones and things that was from when I was younger. Uh, where are we? In five years, he turned HP into the world's largest information technology company. Its share price is shown in the figure. The share price more than doubled. And we'll see that when I get to that next page. So on July 29, 2010, Heard opened a letter from celebrity lawyer Gloria Allred. She's a pretty cool lady if you look her up uh, online, Gloria Allred. Just do it on your own time. She, the letter accused him of sexually harassing an HP marketing contractor named Jody Fisher by touching her body suggestively and speaking of intimate personal matters. It also said he had breached his duty of confidentiality in telling her about HP's pending purchase of electronic data systems in 2008. An eight page chronology of his contacts with this Jody Fisher was enclosed. The letter ended with an offer to settle. He immediately gave it to a Hewlett Packard attorney who forwarded it to the board of directors. In 2007, Heard had begun a series of executive summits held around the, wor around the world to meet important customers. An assistant recommended Jody Foster as a consultant who could help him at the events by briefing him on people, making introductions, and steering him around the room. So he did, there was some sort of relationship. So we're rewinding in, in this story and, and how he met this lady, a consultant. Her qualifications were elusive. After graduating from Texas Tech University with a political science degree, she moved to Los Angeles seeking her fortune as an actress. Her subsequent portfolio included nude Playboy photos, roles in a string of erotic films, such as Intimate Obsession and Blood Dolls, and a reality show appearance. Along the way, she married, divorced, and managed apartments. That sentence is kind of weird. So I guess like she married some people, divorced some people, and she, was, she managed apartments, okay. Anyway, that was her background. 
Heard first interviewed Fisher in Los Angeles. Then she was flown to Denver where they had a three hour dinner. He hired her and between 2007 and 2009, they worked a dozen meetings together at luxury hotels around the world. Often they dined after the day's events. She was paid between 1,000 and 10,000 each time. The 10 members of Hewlett Packard's board were concerned about the letter. That weekend, they conducted a conference call to talk with him. Heard said he and Fisher had dined several times, but were not closely acquainted. He denied any sexual relationship with her. Later, she would say the same. He assured them her accusations were false. Some directors had done searches of her name, discovering her background in adult films. Heard said he was unaware of this. The board was supportive. He wanted to keep, well, Hewlett Packard wanted to keep this talented guy on the board. Shortly, Heard suggested to the board that HP pay to settle the allegations. It did not agree. Uh, it also was unsure of its obligation to disclose events to the shareholders. The board was unsure. If the tale of a CEO and an adult actress came out, tabloid journal journalism would damage HP's reputation. That could affect the share price. If the claims were groundless, however, was there any duty to reveal them? So if really it was a he said, she said, but then later they agreed it was nothing and they settled kind of in confidentiality, then the public didn't need to know about this. The board also hired a law firm to investigate Heard's actions. So he, Heard is a CEO in corporate governance. We have the board of directors, the executive suite, shareholders, customers, vendors, like in, in corporate governance. Well, governance is the board of directors, the C-suite managers, I was just giving you a whole vision of a, what's involved in the circle of a corporation. Because all these people are stake, customers or stakeholders, uh, shareholders are stakeholders. If something negative was to happen, more people could lose their jobs and more people could lose money. Okay, let's carry on. I'll read here. So the board hired a law firm to investigate that that investigation revealed a series of prevarications. While Heard had denied a close relationship with Fisher, a different picture emerged. The two had often died together. They met at times when she did not work at an HP event. One night, HP, Hewlett Packard, the company, flew Fisher to a luxury hotel in Boise, Idaho, where she and Heard had dinner. And they watched a football game. in the bar, then in his room. <laughs> the next day, and, and I, I, you know, we're getting to the point where I'm just going to tell you, uh, th this gentleman passed away. I was actually at a brunch with a friend of mine from Oracle when he got the text message uh, that this gentleman, well, we'll carry on in the story, but I, I just feel sad now to seeing this picture, but I don't want to be talking bad about somebody who died, but you guys just, hear the story. It's, it's a good story for you to know. Okay. And I already jumped ahead because I said he went to Oracle, but let's stay here. <laughs> uh, the next day heard. So the next day heard met with some local officials, but Fisher was not present. That was at that time when he flew her out. And, that, and that's using company money, by the way. Okay, carry on. Heard told the in uh, investigators that he liked to relax with Fisher at the end of the day. She made him feel uplifted. It was, he told investigators, he told investigators a very close personal relationship. So this is now he's saying something different than what he said before. Also, study of Hurd's computer revealed he had viewed 30 pornographic web pages with scenes from her films. An an examination of his expense reports found that six times he dined with Fisher, but the notations recorded his bodyguard as the dinner companion. So he was eating with this lady, but he was saying, reporting that he was eating with his bodyguard. Heard said his assistant filled out the reports 
and often put the bodyguard's name when she didn't know who was there. So that's called throwing somebody under the bus or, you know, passing the buck in the business world. He's like, oh, my assistant, if she didn't know, she just put the bodyguard. At this point, heard support on the board ebbed. Some directors favored firing him, but at least two holdouts wanted to avoid losing such an effective CEO. If the sexual harassment claims were groundless, the rest was of small concern. The directors scheduled a meeting with Gloria Allred to review the allegations. Heard offered to repay the company for contested expense claims amounting to about $20,000. That was a minor amount to him and to the company. Since arriving, he had received $146 million in compensation. Other directors were unpersuaded. This is a quote. He lied to my face and he's lying to you, one of the directors said. He had violated HP's code of conduct, which requires uncompromising integrity from every employee in a company, quote, known for its ethical leadership. We'll discuss more about ethics in this class too. Part of the code set forth a headline test to distinguish right from wrong by asking how actions would look if they came out in the news story. So now they're caring about how it would look in the news. And this is pre 2012. This is in the, it's not even, it's what 2008, 2009, 10, 2010 it said. Cause our book that I'm getting this information from is 2012. Lots more has happened since then. And the business and society today, 2020 textbook the other textbook we're going to be using will have some more up-to-date material. But this is still a great story. That's why I'm sharing it. All right. Plus, it's in our main textbook, the Steiner and Steiner 2012. All right. It also admonishes employees to create business records that accurately reflect the truth. So they're saying that their code says you need to be right when you're recording accounting at work. At HP, a fabricated expense report account was grounds for firing. Early in August, Heard reached an undisclosed financial settlement with Fisher that prohibited her from discussing the allegations. She released a statement saying there were many inaccuracies in her letter. Heard explained he had settled because the amount was small compared with the one in court. The board was furious. Now it would have no chance to hear from Fisher and her lawyers. Heard's remaining supporters gave up and agreed to unanimously vote calling for his resignation. So even though this guy kind of, I guess you could say swept it under the rug, he settled, nobody was gonna say anything. The board was like, we, we will want you to resign. And forcing somebody to resign is like better than just saying, hey, we're gonna fire you. But forcing his re resignation, he complied, meaning he's like, fine, I'll resign. His severance package, meaning because he's resigning and he's going, was worth approximately $40 million. HP share price dropped 14% over the next weeks and did not fully recover for six months. Fisher released a statement that she was saddened by his downfall. Not everyone agreed with the decision. A Wall Street Journal columnist uh, called Heard's offenses piddling. A Los Angeles Times business writer suggested maybe it's the board that should have gone, not heard. Larry Ellison, founder and CEO of Oracle, spoke for many. And this is what Larry said. And it was cool. I had met Larry briefly a couple of years ago at a shareholder meeting of another company where he actually serves on the board of directors. All right, back to the point. The HP board just made the worst personnel decision since the idiots on the Apple board fire Steve Jobs many years ago. In losing Mark Hurd, the HP board failed to act in the best interest of HP employees, shareholders, customers, and partners. Ellison hired Hurd. I don't know Larry Ellison that personally, but his vibe is like, he's more okay with hanging out with women and this and that, and just, but keeping relationships professional and I guess keeping things in order. So his, the vibe with him 
and his corporate culture might, might be a little different. So he hired him as co-president of Oracle. HP filed a trade secrets law. Uh, HP filed a trade secrets lawsuit because Heard had signed a confidentiality agreement. He was intimately familiar with the price the pricing details and component costs of HP pro products in areas where HP and Oracle directly competed. Uh, to settle the suit, Heard waived his rights to 14 million of stock options in his severance package. So he's like, whatever, you know, I'm not gonna take your secrets, but keep your 14 million. I mean, what did we say? He had already gotten 146 million. So he's like, okay, take the 14 million, let's carry on. The Mark Heard story is a story of corporate governance and action. The duty of every company's board is to watch over management in the interest of shareholders. What was the board's duty here? To maximize shareholder wealth or to uphold the integrity of management? In this chapter, corporate governance is discussed and uh, I'll just read exactly what it says. We define corporate governance and explain how it works. We also discuss its flaws. An unusual part of the Mark Hurd story is like is that unlike many corp unlike many corporate boards, this one had the courage to fire a CEO, as we will show many do not. So many keep their CEOs. Since 2012 till today, there are many who have resigned because these kind of little similar situations pop up and they're just like, let me just go because I don't want my family to hear. I don't want it to get on the news. I don't, you know, I'll still get out with a lot of money. That's like if I was that CEO and I was in that position, I'd be like, okay, let me just let me just resign. And otherwise, other ones who it doesn't matter because some people like Larry is a super smart guy, Larry Ellison. I didn't mean to say anything bad about him. I wasn't. I was actually talking positive about him that he saw Mark's talent and took him on and he did well for Mark Heard did well at Oracle and he was loved there. And it's like a live and learn situation. So it's like now you don't, you, you're kind of more careful about the consultants that you hire <laughs> or you sign NDAs ahead of time. Uh, since 2012, when things like this happen, I assure you, high level uh, males and female, high level males meet with females. I also know, and this is a personal communication from, I can't, I, it's confidential, I can't say it, but high level female CEOs also have relations with males. Or, so there, the, these relations are, are there, but since 2012, things have changed. People are more careful about NDAs, where you take pictures, where you're seen together. And one of my mentors, uh, maybe I'll tell you his name later. He has a top rule. Never, ever, 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 ever be in an elevator alone with another person of the opposite sex or same sex or whatever. Just It's just the, his go-to rule. It's sometimes elevators have cameras, but don't ever be, because that's where people can get into these he, he said, she said situations. In a previous lecture of mine, I talk about uh, Mike Tyson and Robin Gibbons. So situations happen, and that's a that's a story from probably before most of you guys' time, but it's related. Uh, I want to close right now because we're going to start our class. I recorded this for you guys during my office hours because I wanted to test this mic out. Hopefully, I, I don't know how it worked. We won't know until I shut this off and try it. But if you didn't, if you didn't want to read the story in the book, hey, I just read it to you. Let me know if you like that and how the audio sounded. All right. Now I'm going to stop the recording.